Good day. My name is Paul Wax. I'm the executive director of the American College of Medical Toxicology. And I'd like to welcome everyone to this special webinar series entitled Medical and Public Health Considerations of COVID-19. Today's topics are FDA regulatory toolbox for COVID-19 response, research highlights, remdesivir, hydroxychloroquine, and updates from the front lines from Florida and India. Next slide. I'd like to thank our webinar series partners. Next slide. And at this point, I'd like to turn it over to my uh, co-moderator, Dr. Ziad Kazi, who will introduce our first speaker. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm really excited to uh, bring these uh, uh, two topics today for you as part of our didactic presentation. So I remind you to uh, uh, type in your questions uh, as they come up during the session. We will address them at the end. Also want to remind you that this is being recorded and will be available to you for viewing as of Friday this week. I want to also bring to your attention that we are having a um, special uh, town hall Q&A on Friday at 12 noon Eastern. We'll provide some information at the end of this presentation about that town hall Q&A on PPEs. The uh, first speaker today is Elizabeth Sato, uh, JD. She is uh, going to talk to us about the FDA regulatory toolbox for COVID-19 response. Elizabeth is a director of medical countermeasures, regulatory poli the policy of the Office of Counterterrorism and Emerging Threats, of Office of Chief Scientist, Office of the Commissioner at the US FDA. Um, we wanted to have Elizabeth share with us some information today because the FDA is a very important agency in the COVID-19 response, and she will uh, discuss during her presentation, the important steps that FDA has taken during this pandemic. She will be uh, followed by Dr. Charles McKay, who will give us an update on the latest research data that we have uh, seen in the literature about remdesivir and hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine. Uh, Dr. McKay is the past president of the American College of Medical Toxicology, the associate medical director of the Connecticut Poison Control Center and the Associate Clinical Professor at the University of Connecticut School of Medicine in Farmington, Connecticut. We'll start with Dr. Sayle. Hi, uh, thank you uh, so, so much for the invitation to speak with you today. Um, I um, wanted to start by just uh, explaining a little bit of an overview of FDA's role um, within a, an emergency response such as what we're dealing with with the COVID-19. Um, FDA's uh, primary role is to facilitate the development and availability of safe and effective medical countermeasures for their intended use um, it, to provide public assurance of, of the, that they have met the FDA standards. Um, in a situation such as, as this, we often have no approved medical products uh, to bring to bear to respond to, to a, um, a, a new and emerging virus for, like COVID. So we have uh, special legal mechanisms to allow us to facilitate emergency use of unapproved products. And that has been um, a large focus of my personal activities. Um, I've been in this field for uh, 15 years now, and we have never use these authorities to the extent that we are using them uh, today uh, to be addressing this over the last couple of months. Um, we also are actively involved in trying to prevent shortages of all types of medical products, um, medical devices, personal protective equipment across the board, um, all the products that are used in routine care, not only just the products that we're trying to uh, bring to bear for the COVID response. Um, we're involved in protecting the blood supply and tissue transport or tissue for transplantation and um, ensuring consumer protection against fraud. We've, we've been out there um, actively uh, engaging uh, companies that are peddling products on, on the web, for example. And another area that we are very involved in is, is efforts to try to improve the assessment of products that are on the market using uh, electronic health records and all sorts of um, uh, technologies that 
we have been working to try to do in the past and in the midst of an emergency, we're, we're actively out there trying to, to um, ramp them up. Um, and I just wanna say when we, I talk about medical countermeasures, what I'm talking about are um, the not drugs, biologics, vaccines, all the types of devices, diagnostic tests, personal protective equipment. And um, these generally, this category is defined as those counter, those measures that are used against uh, chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear agents and emerging infectious diseases. So that's what brings us into this COVID, um, using these authorities for a COVID response. And just to give you a sense of, of the breadth of activity that we have been engaged with um, over the past you know, couple of months, starting in the beginning of February, we have issued over 75 emergency use authorizations. And I'll go into explaining what that an emergency use authorization is. Um, that's, I, I'd like to think that's probably more than we had in the history of having that authority, which we, we've had for a, a, over 10 years. 15 years now. Um, we've also been using them in a way that um, is novel in what we are calling umbrella EUAs, where we are issuing an EUA for a category of product that meets specific criteria. And I'll talk a little bit about that, but that's enabled us to authorize the emergency use of hundreds of medical countermeasures in a way that we had never done before. Um, I'll talk a little bit about comparing the what an EUA is compared to our investigational authorities, um, but under our um, IND, in Investigational New Drug Authorities, or IDE, in Investigational Device Exemptions, um, we have emergency authorities under those as well. So we have, you, you probably hear it referred to as compassionate use, for example, that would be a single emergency use IND. And we have issued, I, I, when I put this together, it was set over 1700. I know that that number has drastically increased. Um, but we're trying to bring those into clinical trials and rely less on that. So either bring it into a protocol for expanded access, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, um, so that we're not um, addressing each individual patient. Um, we've provided regulatory advice to literally hundreds. I put 500 in there, but hundreds of medical countermeasure developers. We've had pre-IND consultations and we've uh, developed a program to help facilitate really rapid interactions with the product developers. And we have a program, um, which I'll, go, I'll explain, but that has enabled FDA to um, have oversight of over 72 clinical trials of potential therapies um, that are underway, uh, that are in development, but overseeing the uh, those uh, many that many trials. We've issued 35 guidance documents, and I'll explain a little bit about the difference between what guidance does compared to what, it, let's say, an emergency use authorization does. It allows FDA to articulate. Um, a regulatory flexibility, but it's not provide, it, it's uh, under what we would say enforcement discretion. We're just not going to enforce against that. As opposed to under, let's say an emergency use authorization, when we say we're authorizing you to do something that that is allowing you to do it legally under the Federal Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act. We've also issued over 30 warning letters to firms that are, are fraudulently peddling products. Um, let's see. So I, I was asked to kind of help put a framework around all these different authorities that we are using. And the best way to understand and explain this is really within the context of the investigational develop, the development of the product itself. And through the light, these authorities really do cover the life cycle of a medical product. So what, well, the way we think about it and the way um, over over time we've really come to, to implement these authorities is recognition that the best way to get a product that is not approved and, um, and to, available, to be available to respond would be under a controlled clinical trial. 
And we start the conversation by trying to uh, work with the sponsors, work with the government, however we can to support the study within a clinical trial of the product. It's the, the most definitive, the fastest way to determine whether the product is safe and effective. Um, and it safeguards patient safety. It maintains trust with use of the product um, uh, uh, when you have those uh, protections in place. And it's really the fastest way to um, understand and learn whether the product is is working or not. Um, however, we, we the reason we have these authorities is because in the midst of an emergency, we often find that the circumstances and the medical need is such that we, we have to employ mechanisms that um, help us to work within those, uh, the, the, the IND human subject protection structure or with the emergency use authorization is a different framework and we work outside of that. Each has its advantages and disadvantages. I put, when you look at the arrow here, um, you can see that clinical trials is a rather structured approach, which you're probably familiar with, where you have research and development and you go through step-by-step -step phases um, of study. Sometimes in these emergencies, we kind of blur phase one, phase two and three, merge it together and get products um, assessed as fast as possible. Um, and we have pathways that help us um, accelerate those kind of um, efforts. But in expanded access, you have to have under expanded access. And I'm going to let me advance it here. I'll go more into detail about what expanded access offers. Um, and, and this is for the lawyers that may be out there. It's really um, everything that we do is based on a statutory authority. And so I, I really want, it was important to provide that statutory understanding that expanded access is an emergency mechanism under our investigational authorities. The emergency use authorization is a separate authority. Um, and then we have uh, other outside of the emergency use authorization, we have additional authorities that are uh, applicable to approved products. And I'll, it, it hasn't really come to bear very much during this COVID response, but I'll just explain just so you have the full understanding of it all. Um, so for the ex clinical trials and expanded access, um, as I, I mentioned, it is within the context of the uh, um, investigational framework. So if we implement an expanded access protocol, um, for whether for a single patient or what we would say an expanded access protocol for multiple patients bringing under the umbrella um, in, uh, access, uh, larger in intermediate sized populations or larger populations, it still preserves the patient safeguards of informed consent and approval by an institutional review board. The investigation, the investigator or the doctor determines that um, an FDA must confirm that there's no comparable or satisfactory alternative therapy available. The probable risk to the person from the product is not greater than the risk of the disease. And the FDA determines based on the available information, there's sufficient evidence of safety and effectiveness to support um, use given the context of the disease, and it will not interfere with initiation, conduct, or completion of the clinical study supporting approval. So we have used this mechanism for the COVID response, uh, working with our government partners to prioritize, identify the um, candidate thera therapeutics, and we establish an acceleration program to help bring um, as many therapeutics under these trials as possible. And, and you can see some of the different categories of therapeutics that are being brought into the clinical trial um, mechanisms. We have antivirals, we have um, IL-6 inhibitors, um, hydrochloroquine, chloroquine, convalescent plasma has been a, a large focus re most recently. And we established because there were so many individual patient requests, a con uh, um, expanded access protocol for uh, and a website of how to get to it for convalescent plasma. Uh, also, I wanted to make aware that we have uh, a partnership with the Reagan Udall Foundation, um, which is put, put together a navigator to help people find these expanded access protocols. So with that context, it's important to 
understand when I start to explain how emergency use authorizations are thought about that they are outside of this framework that ensures um, the human subject protections of informed consent and investigational re review board. It's a statutory authority through which FDA can authorize use of uh, all the different types of products that I, I explained to diagnose, prevent, treat an unapproved me um, a medical product or an unapproved use of an approved medical product. So that would be for a new indication like COVID, um, a new virus that uh, is, is, is circulating. Um, it, it is an authority that is based um, statutorily, there has to be a determination. And in this case, the public health determination that was um, issued uh, earlier this year is a foundational determination, but there are four types of determinations that can support an EUA. And based on that determination, the HHS secretary has to make a declaration that the uh, justifying the emergency use of the particular type of product that we would be issuing an EUA for. So there are declarations in place for um, diagnostics, a separate declaration for medical devices, um, and we have a declaration in place for um, drugs and biologics. So you will hear different words about different declarations. It's important that there be a declaration for the EUA itself. And FDA then um, assesses whether or not um, a product meets the specific statutory criteria before it can issue an EUA. And that those criteria are that it is a serious or life-threatening disease or condition caused by the seaburn agent, in this case, COVID. Um, it, there's a reasonable belief that the product may be effective, which is a, is a very flexible standard there. Um, it's based on the, the um, available scientific evidence to the agency that the known and potential benefits outweigh the known and potential risks benefits of the product outweigh the risks of the, the disease or condition, and that there are no approved adequate or available alternatives to the product. And there are no treatments for COVID. So, so that becomes a, a rather, you know, a statutory standard is relatively easy to meet in this case. The way the authority works is that FDA can scope the authorization itself to in, to adjust to protect what we believe based on the scientific evidence is reasonable to protect um, that the what we think the benefits outweigh the risks for. So in the scope of the authorization, we would put limitations on the who what the population would be, what the product uh, where it might be coming from, for example, uh, from the strategic national stockpile, we might um, only authorize product from uh, a, a that's been approved, let's say, in the um, has a CE mark from from Europe, um, and it also allows us to. There are some mandatory conditions and some discretionary conditions that we impose upon the use of the product. Um, that also helps to frame it in um, in terms of how we would. Uh, uh, discuss the, the benefits and the risks for the product. Um, we have labeling requirements. Uh, it, it cannot be marketed that it is an FDA approved, licensed or cleared product. And it has to notify the recipient of the risks and benefits of the product. Um, and in many cases, um, requests for EUAs are driven by um, reasons of needing to articulate how to use a product off label let's say we fda doesn't regulate the, pra the practice of medicine but often in an emergency response if cdc is making recommendations about how to utilize a, a medication then it would ask fda to issue an eua so that it can articulate um, that uh, how off label use for example um, there are also liability protections that are brought into play during public health emergencies under the PREP Act. And um, in order to get those liability protections, it has to be an FDA licensed approved 
um, product uh, studied under an investigational application or authorized under an EUA. And often those types of considerations um, drive requests to issue EUAs. So, you know, I mentioned we have issued a, a, just an unprecedented number of EUAs during this response. Um, you may have heard or have seen about the one uh, we issued a few weeks ago for hydro hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine. Um, that one in large part was driven by the fact that FDA was seeing a large um, amount of prescribing off label for um, this COVID-19 response, which was driving up shortages. And there was um, donations that were being offered to bring uh, more into the supply chain. And um, so FDA did a, you know, a risk benefit analysis and a review of all the available data at, at the time and um, made an assessment that it, the benefits outweighed the risks for, again, scoped the population to certain hospitalized patients that did not have access to the clinical trials. That enabled um, product to be brought in and to the strategic national stockpile. And so the EUA allowed um, use of the product that is coming out of the strategic national stockpile for that um, purpose. It also had conditions for safety reporting and um, reporting outcomes information back to um, HHS, which was the sponsor of the EUA. Um, we're also trying to uh, monitor uh, through electronic uh, systems at uh, the Sentinel system at FDA, trying to monitor the use uh, data and get some information on that. Um, FDA is also obviously um, supporting and trying to get information from clinical trials that are ongoing and NIH is supporting clinical trials of that product. Um, there have, in terms of the drug landscape, there have been uh, num numbers of requests. I'd say we, we under consideration are, are somewhere around the number of 10 e uh, requests for e issuance of EUAs for different drugs, some of which are just drugs in shortage that are used um, in intensive care situations and others are for some of these investigational therapeutics. Um, so, you know, again, the considerations that I laid out there in terms of clinical trial, trying to gather the data, whether expanded access makes more sense versus an emergency use authorizations. These are the types of things that we're actively working on right now. And the most uh, compelling or, or the, where all, a lot of this activity has been has been within the device space. Um, I guess first would be the, the testing um, landscape. Um, FDA has issued uh, 42 EUAs, uh, and I, I, I'd have to say 43 because we just issued one again today. <laughs> and um, 16 tests for or have been uh, under what I mentioned was an umbrella EUA. So we issued an EUA for laboratory developed tests that are used in high complexity laboratories. And um, we have 16 of those authorized under that umbrella EUA. Four of the uh, 42 EUAs issued are ser serological tests. And I know that more are going to be coming out over the, the next couple of, um, over the next weeks. Um, that has, is a large focus of, the, of our activity right now. And um, we have worked with more than 340 test developers who have said they're coming, they, they will be submitting EU, EUA requests for tests. And we've been notified that more than 210 laboratories have begun um, testing under the, the laboratory development test uh, enforcement discretion policy. Um, so we've had a lot of activity in that and questions about, um, it, it, we, we do weekly a webinar about that. We have an FAQ about what um, diagnostic tests are um, uh, allowed to be out there under enforcement discretion and the validation behind those tests. Um, everything is posted on our website. Um, and just the, the area of that is the most novel during this response that has really taken up a lot of uh, my personal time has to do with the uh, other types of devices. 
Um, for the personal protective equipment uh, is is obviously a huge priority. And when sh there was threatened shortages and um, at, we have been using the, the emergency use authorization authorities to bring unapproved products, unapproved respiratory protective devices uh, into the, the marketplace. So um, we have an EUA for uh, NIOSH cleared devices that are not FDA regulated necessarily. Necessarily, FDA only regulates the surgical N95 surgical respirators. So there's a large number of non-surgical respirators that needed to be brought into the um, umbrella EUA concept. We've also issued EUAs for imported um, N95 or uh, our respiratory protective devices, not more than N95s. And um, we've also issued EUAs for decontamination systems. But there are five decontamination systems that are under um, an EUA at the moment. Uh, more, I'm sure, will be coming so that hospitals can sanitize uh, and decontaminate um, the and you know the respiratory protective devices that they have and, and, and reuse them. We've also issued EUAs for, we have an, an umbrella EUA for ventilators, um, which has gotten a lot of uh, uh, um, product underneath uh, that EUA, um, bringing in alternative modifications to approved ventilators and um, new ventilators that might be marketed in other countries or, or uh, modifications or even being uh, manufactured uh, here. Um, other devices, extra cor corporeal blood purification systems, infusion pumps, um, it, it, new devices are, are really um, coming at us as they, they go into shortage and as we go down this response. So I, I didn't want to, um, I don't know, oh, I wanted to ask, I was asked also just to e explain these other authorities that fall into this bucket of other authorities, they're applicable to FDA approved products. So this would be um, if we have an approved product, let's say for COVID-19, this would allow us to have use um, expiration dating extensions, do certain things that otherwise would be violative of the Federal Food and Drugs Cosmetic Act without having to issue an EUA. But because there are no medical products really approved for COVID-19, we haven't really used these authorities too heavily. We did use um, the CGMP waiver authority to allow deviations for contract manufacturing and of, of an FDA approved ventilator. Um, we've used the pre-positioning authority quite a bit to bring unapproved products. It allows you to ship them before, let's say an EUA is authorized. Um, there, we haven't really used um, the emergency dispensing orders or uh, emergency use instructions, which is an authority that is delegated to D CDC. Um, again, because we don't really have um, many approved products that would really um, be benefit from that type of authority. And, and I, I'm gonna end you know, I, uh, here just to show you that we are trying really hard to behind the scenes gather information um, we work, we're working with clinical networks to get clinical trials in place, but we're also trying, we have a, a, the Sentinel system, which we're trying to put protocols in place to gather data out of. Um, we have uh, others within FDA that are very focused on um, how we can use unstructured big data um, to understand what is going on, not only with the regard to specific products, um, like how is like hydroxychloroquine um, working and, and what adverse events that are we seeing, but also trying to um, get assessments of drug use and assessments related to drug shortages that are uh, out there to keep ahead of where the shortages are, are uh, emerging. So um, I think I, I uh, ended up and this I, I, is really, we are putting everything we have online. So I'm, I, I offer to you the websites that you can take back with you. And we are updating these, you know, more than daily. They're, they're constantly updated. So uh, I, I will leave you with that.
Thank you very much. This was a very impressive uh, description of the uh, gigantic efforts that you all have undertaken. Thank you so much for keeping keeping us safe and and providing all these resources. Uh, please uh, type in your questions for um, this specific uh, presentation. We will address those at the end and we'll ask our speaker to wait uh, till the end if it's okay. Uh, when we move on to our next speaker for an update on remdesivir and hydroxychloroquine chloroquine research studies that have just come out, Dr. Chuck McKay, go ahead. No, thank you, Zia. Uh, what I'd like to do is just take a very uh, short five minutes here and just go through uh, the kind of whirlwind of studies that have been coming out now in the last little bit. If we think back a long time ago, which in this framework is about two months ago, uh, we have uh, the initial results that were coming out of China regarding treatment. And I've got a series of just a few uh, very busy slides, but there's a lot of information on them that I just invite you to view at your, your own leisure. Each of the slides will have a, you know, a, a copy or print of the uh, article face piece, so you can go find them online and read them through yourself. What I'd really like to do in this short time is just to point out some of the problems with the studies and some of the things that are that we can maybe take away from both each study and then from this uh, process of uh, looking at non-peer-reviewed and uh, rapid uh, uh, production papers uh, in general. So uh, initially out of, out of China, we had some information indicating a large number of studies that were ongoing um, with uh, an interim report and really just a letter that was describing 100 patients that demonstrated uh, to the authors that chloroquine phosphate was superior to control inhibiting the exacerbation of uh, pneumonia, improving lung function, and promoting a, a virus conversion to negative by PCR testing and shortening disease course. I looked at the trials uh, the Chinese National Trial Site uh, uh, this week. And of those uh, 15 prospective studies that were identified in the letter, six have been canceled for lack of enrollment, seven had no control group, which is a recurring process, uh, problem as, as we go through a lot, of, a lot of these studies. On that site, there is another 10 studies in addition to those 15 that are now listed as being active, although two of them have been canceled since mid-February. One of them is retrospective, one doesn't have a control group. And right now, if you look at, there's about 14 studies that are on the national trial site. Um, that they have some important uh, restrictions, we call them. Uh, many of the things we might rest in, particularly in terms of chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, in terms of toxicity are specifically exclusion criteria for some of the studies. And the elderly is, is another exclusion criteria for many of them. So I just put this up to kind of indicate that we need to be very careful interpreting results that come out. A large number of patients are going to be looked at, but they may not necessarily be the patients that you are trying to decide how you should your own practice. Um, we, everybody is familiar, I think, with some of the studies coming out in Marseille. Uh, and this is the uh, expanded uh, study. Uh, out of the uh, Raul group there with, um, at this point, uh, you know, in this second paper, which was released at the end of March, uh, a report on 80 patients uh, following through on their initial uh, findings that treatment with hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin uh, resulted in very rapid uh, conversion to a negative uh, PCR uh, testing for uh, carriage of the virus in their patients. I guess the thing I would just uh, emphasize on this paper, and particularly in an abstract that has came out from the same group uh, uh, a week or so now, is that these were very mildly uh, affected patients who are in general younger than most of ours. The, the paper looking at 80 uh, patients had uh, 52 years as their median age. The, pay, the abstract that came out last week is actually in the mid 40s as their age group. And only half of these patients described actually had any evidence of pneumonia. So they were mostly upper respiratory uh, symptoms. And if you, you see in this one excerpt from their discussion in the middle there where they mentioned that um, it appeared that they had in clinical improvement that was significant when compared to natural level 
infection, et cetera, et cetera, that Chinese inpatient groups that they're comparing to had a much, much higher incidence of both pneumonia and were more severely ill. So a caution in terms of taking these results as they just sit. Uh, Dr. Wax to know, let me know about paper released yesterday. Again, this is a non-peer-reviewed pre-publication release. Um, this is looking at the, the Veterans Administration system, so it's a very systematic evaluation of results, but it is also uh, not a, well, it's a retrospective study, so they're able to look at people who did get hydroxychloroquine, who did, and you can see the numbers there, but they note in the paper that the uh, hydroxychloroquine group was sicker, uh, whether looking at vital signs, laboratory findings, or chronic disease, including a number of important issues like uh, cerebrovascular disease, uh, for example. So it, the question is whether those uh, findings are actually then uh, applicable and attributable to the treatment or whether there was some other issue. And there's a few questions that I've listed here that I think we need to ask, ask when we are looking at these papers and that need to be answered before the peer reviewed uh, uh, draft of the paper is accepted. One example here I'll just note is that uh, the patients who were given um, hydroxychloroquine tended to die more frequently or they had a, you know, a twofold uh, increased hazard of dying, but they had no increased risk of getting uh, uh, mechanical ventilation. So in the US, you know, who died getting mechanical ventilation? Is it people, you know, who have sudden arrhythmias? Well, that would be an important thing to know, but they didn't report anything about EKGs or QT measurements. Or is it patients who may have been determined in this elderly group to be a, a DNR? And then that not be an impact of the treatment, but just an impact of those decisions. So that would be a concern again with these with these uh, these papers. Uh, let me move on to the next one here, which is the Brazilian paper on chloroquine. This was the interim safety report where a, a group of 40 patients being treated with uh, uh, chloroquine at a higher dose were removed from uh, or the treat that treatment arm was stopped because of an increased risk of mortality. You can see there 39 versus 15 percent and the the uh, survival probability shown on the right hand side there compared to a cohort of Chinese patients admitted with uh, pneumonia. The problem here is that most of the elderly patients were in that high dose group. Um, they did find that two of the people in the high dose group developed ventricular tachycardia with potential concern of uh, QT pro QTC prolongation, which was shown to be more common, but it's it's also uh, not was not uh, routinely and 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 uh, you know, systematically measured. So that is still becomes an, a question whether these adverse effects in this case would be attributable to the to the chloroquine. And then we have the remdesivir. This is a label a compassion use study reported out in the journal uh, last week. And the issue here was you know there's no control group. So how do you know that the results of the uh, improved outcome demonstrated in their uh, administration was because of the administration of the additional drug? And um, there are some important anecdotal findings here. Uh, you know, people's uh, recovery following the beginning of use of the drug, uh, being able to be taken off of ECMO. Th these are significant findings, but there's no way to actually straight these were due to the drug itself versus the clinical care that was received uh, for this admittedly very sick group of patients so you know what can we take away from these studies and i think the the major thing that that we can take away is that it's sort of the bottom here we really need to be able to compare the groups that are being studied and the treatments and the outcomes and when there are groups of people who are compared to historic controls that had different conditions or different severities of conditions, then you cannot just accept those results, right? At this point, you know, certainly if you are very young and have mild illness, doxycycline uh, and maybe even chloroquine are gonna be well tolerated, but they may not make a difference in your clinical course. They may clear your viral load 
faster but we don't really know because that right now seems to be contaminated by the severity of illness of the patient as opposed to the treatment itself. And again, the remdesivir group is showing that they did have some remarkable clinical recoveries, but we don't yet know whether that's because of the drug. So I'm left with thinking back to something that Finley Russell, the toxicologist and neurologist way back last century, said, you know, when someone gives an antidote and the patient doesn't die, the only thing you really know is that the treatment didn't kill the person. And we're still left to try and figure out whether these treatments have much validity in and of themselves. And I'd refer everybody also to the NIH's National Institute of Allergic and Infectious Disease treatment guidelines that were released last night, which also go through a number of different treatments and recommend caution at this point and do not recommend use of any drug on a routine basis in the absence of clinical trials and the FDA's EUA. You know, any adverse effects do need to be reported because we're still at this point trying to find our way through this process. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. McKay, for providing this very useful and interesting digest of the literature that's really coming out very, very rapidly. We hope to be able to provide these on a periodic basis in our webinars. So thank you for doing that. Moving along to the updates on the front lines, just want to give you all a heads up that we're going to probably stay over 4 p.m., maybe about 10, 15 minutes for the Q&A. So please continue typing your questions in the chat box or the Q&A box, and we will get to those at the end. I'll ask our speakers to stick around as well online. The updates from the front lines today features two colleagues, Dr. Ashish Bala, president of the Asia Pacific Association of Medical Toxicology and a fellow of ACMT as well, if I may add, professor of medicine and medical toxicology at the Postgraduate Institute of Medical Education Research in Chandigarh, Punjab, India. We also will hear from Dr. David Farsi, who is the president of the American Academy of Emergency Medicine and the chair of the Department of Emergency Medicine and director of Emergency Medicine and Critical Care at Mount Sinai Medical Center in Miami Beach, Florida. We'll start with Dr. Bala for a brief update, followed by Dr. Farsi, and then at the end, the Q&A. Dr. Bala, go ahead. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, and we appreciate you being up so late to give us this update. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity. I just wanted to uh, update you on uh, what's happening here in India. Uh, we've got nearly 20,000 plus patients and uh, our mortality has been around 3.2% uh, uh, max uh, uh, till reported till now. We in Chandigarh uh, at PGI have a standalone 200 bedded uh, uh, hospital which has been designated as uh, a COVID uh, treatment uh, hospital and we are accepting only positive patients. We've treated till now 26 cases out of which two have died and we have uh, discharged uh, uh, 14 patients as of today uh, from the hospital. And our first patient was a doctor from London who refused uh, any sort of treatment. Uh, we were uh, planning to give azithromycin and hydroxychloroquine uh, in line with the, uh, with the uh, instructions from the Indian Council of Medical Research and Ministry of Health that that should be the treatment recommended, uh, azithromycin and hydroxychloroquine together. But uh, uh, she refused to take any treatment and she got well in five days' time. She was afebrile, and she was discharged on day 40. And uh, uh, after that, we have been giving azithromycin and uh, hydroxychloroquine to all our patients, but majority, as Chuck has mentioned, majority of our patients are mild cases, and we are monitoring them uh, for QT prolongation by doing uh, routine ECG uh, routine ECG monitoring in them. Now, uh, we have uh, 
started a, 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 a multi-centric, multinational project on uh, hydroxychloroquine as a prophylaxis for healthcare workers. And uh, this is a project which is run from Canada, uh, University of uh, Manitoba. And uh, we have till date recruited around 150 people, healthcare workers, majority of them nursing staff, which are working at the front line in the severe acute respiratory illness unit and the intensive care unit, along with the medical residents and faculty members who are uh, working there and uh, nearly 82% of them uh, have tolerated this drug pretty well. Uh, most of them have received uh, just two uh, doses, one loading dose of 400 milligram PD and then after one week another dose of 400 milligram OD. Most of them have received two doses there has been one person who has dropped out because he uh, uh, was a medical resident and, and he reported uh, so that is why uh, that is why he dropped out all the uh, other people have tolerated it well the symptoms which have been commonly reported uh, Adverse symptoms have been dizziness, giddiness, nausea. Uh, not very many people have reported vomiting or tinnitus. So uh, that's uh, that's one part which I Zia had asked me to cover. And the second aspect uh, which uh, uh, I was asked to cover is the staffing pattern at our hospitals in India. There is a lot of fear amongst the healthcare workers who are working as frontline workers, uh, the nursing staff, technicians, the janitors. Uh, so uh, the ministry recommended that we uh, make an arrangement where we give uh, a continuous uh, working in the hospital for seven to 10 days, followed by uh, two weeks of uh, quarantine. Uh, the reason for quarantine and uh, the reason for uh, six hours shift and seven to ten days of work is that uh, majority of the people cannot work in the personal protective equipment for more than six hours. So this is uh, what uh, was uh, is being followed at our institute as well. Uh, but the major issue is uh, the problem is the uh, making the arrangements for this staff to stay back. Most of them have refused to go back home or go back to their hostels where they are staying. So they, uh, we have to make uh, arrangements for their stay and for their quarantine period as well, which is turning out to be kind of a nightmare. Uh, we, uh, the first group of people who worked for seven days and uh, were quarantined for 14 days uh, were all asymptomatic for this quarantine period and have been sampled uh, today. So by tomorrow we might be getting their reports and then uh, kind of uh, if, they, if they are negative then we'll probably get them uh, back to the duties in the hospital. Uh, but uh, we are now looking at uh, an arrangement where we might have to ask all our healthcare workers to work in six hours shift for at least a period of 14 days and then give them a quarantine period of 14 days before they come back to work. So that's uh, the update from Frontline from uh, India, uh, from Chandigarh. Thank you, Dr. Bala. Thank you so much. And uh, please stick around for some Q&As. I'm sure we'll have some additional questions. Uh, Dr. Marcy, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Dr. Bala, please mute yourself. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Kazi. And uh, thank you very much to the American College of Medical Toxicology for having me. I'll try to uh, make brief. Uh, first, I do want to say congratulations to Dr. Kazi. Uh, right now would be our scientific assembly 
and you would be getting the Rolex Award. So again, congratulations for being the recipient of this distinguished award from the American Academy to show excellence in education. And this this is your 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 uh, event is been second time, third time listening, and it's been great. Our frontline um, event, you know, we've been at this since uh, March 16 in Miami Beach. Uh, Miami Beach has been the hardest hit uh, city in the state of Florida, mainly secondary to our um, uh, LGBTQ party that was hosted two weeks uh, before um, in uh, early March. And we started seeing some multiple, multiple cases. And this disease is a devil of a disease. It's a turn on, turn off. Uh, suddenly you get 10 patients and then next thing you know, you have 50 patients. Um, luckily for us, we're, we have some really strong ties within the academy and within the world. We've been, we've been uh, studying and learning from, this, from physicians all across uh, uh, the the world and basically it was on my first day when i had a patient who went ama with uh, all two side of 70 percent that i said something was wrong how can this guy um, arguing with me with all two side of 70 percent and i was wondering if i was losing it or if i was seeing what i was seeing and this is kind of the concept that we we came out with the permissive hypoxia where we're tolerating numbers that none of us would ever ever before uh, before COVID would have ever accepted patient in the 60s, 70s. And we, after studying uh, and the literature and looking, we were trying to avoid intubation because the death mark uh, was so high. And so looking at some of the study that was done, we used the vapor firm at our hospital, which is a high velocity uh, nasal flow. So, and we use it with a mask and we were, um, had significant success on that, on avoiding uh, intubation, uh, on, and mainly on the younger one, the younger one with our medical uh, complaint. But our patient population is um, is more than 80s, um, where South Florida. I'm glad to report that today the IRB for a, a retrospective prospective trial was accepted, so we'll start collecting data. Um, uh, next week, uh, this week, and hopefully have something uh, uh, reported. Um, or, uh, or it's uh, something that we need to be very careful from the emergency room to the ICU. I also work in the ICU. A lot of uh, coagulopathies, uh, tremendous amount of coagulopathies. Uh, those patients will have PEs, DVTs, microfrombies, uh, neurological event, uh, digital toes. I mean, this this, we call it the evil syndrome because we're not, we're seeing so many different, um, and I know I'm talking toxicologists that wants probably a mechanism, and I'm sorry, I'm not that smart, uh, but we don't really know the cascade. This is like a cytokine storm that we've never seen before. I did a trauma critical care fellowship, and it looks like that that burn slash trauma, that, that cytokine that that is affecting almost every organ. Uh, the most we, we've done the doxy, doxy uh, I'm sorry, the uh, hydrochloroquine, whatever it's called, the hydroxychloroquine. Um, we didn't change. We did change our protocol because of our age group. We didn't give 800, and then 400. We actually halved it. And we did an EKG on every patient, and so far, um, we haven't had a death uh, secondary that we know of. Um, since we're Miami Beach, most uh, patients come to our, our institution. Uh, we're excited to report that we've uh, started the uh, plasma serum exchange, the convalescent serum, uh, and that has been probably the most exciting um, things that I've seen. We've now have enrolled six patients. Uh, basically, the one blood, you can tag a patient and get a convalescent uh, for the same uh, ABO. And, um, and we were giving it, we did on six patients, and so far our patients were able to uh, uh, come out uh, either extubated or came off uh, ECMO. Uh, other than this, the medication, you've, I'm not, I'm not going to go into it because I think you've gone into this. 
Uh, PPE is a must. I've been, I taught all my staff that there is no emergencies in pandemic. Uh, we lucky to report that we have not had a single infection of our staff and uh, extremely proud that we spent a lot of time before the, the, uh, our surge spending um, our volume now has triggered significantly. We, uh, we passed our surge on the 16th and now we're down to seeing only 25 uh, COVID patients a day and about 60 other, which is about 50% of our volume. Again, thank you very much for the opportunity. I know it's a very brief, brief uh, but I'm trying to keep it to five minutes. Thank you, Dr. Farsi, for the update. Dr. Wax? Yes, um, well, thank to the uh, faculty um, for wonderful uh, um, presentations and discussions. We're going to uh, open this up to uh, Q&A for about 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, if you have questions, you know, please uh, type them in the uh, Q&A box or the chat box. Uh, the first uh, couple questions I'm going to ask our uh, FDA uh, colleague uh, to comment on, and uh, we'll unmute you, or you need to take yourself off mute. Uh, and uh, so the first question is about uh, some of the performance problems with some of the testing um, and uh, um, how the FDA is, is, is uh, following this and what sort of uh, advice are they giving to, to the public uh, regarding concerns about um, some of the testing problems? So, um, yeah, I, I you know, this has been an evolution, I guess, is is all I can can say to respond to that. The the tests that FDA are authorizing, we are confident of the quality of those tests. Um, at the outset, we have um, in order to it, uh, the challenges are really around um, the swabs, the getting the tubing, the media, the, the reagents, everything out there that is needed to keep up with the demand. So still, after all the um, work that we're going, going into authorizing use of what are, um, I think FDA would say, good tests, we're not able to keep up with the, the demand because of, of all those um, factors that go into it. And we're continually working with manufacturers to s expand um, what reagents can be used, different swabs, different extraction methods, et cetera, for the different tests. So I, my only advice that I can I can offer with this regard, and and we've uh, you know we've allowed a lot of testing, sero serological testing, um, laboratory developed tests, um, to be legally um, out there based on their own validity testing. We have um, set up a consortium with NIH and NCI where they're actually going to be also doing independent confirmation of validity testing of the tests that are serology tests and other laboratory tests that are submitted to them so that we can increase the um, confidence for all those tests that are out there. Um, it, it, so it's, it, it's sort of a balance of supply and demand and assurance of the quality of the tests. Those that we are getting uh, information about that are not performing adequately, we are going after um, and, and trying to get those off, off the market. So I don't know, that, that's yeah, the best okay, we're doing yeah, thank, at the moment. Thank, yeah, thank you for that uh, response. Uh, a couple more questions to you. Um, uh, for labs like Abbott, for instance, uh, are they, are they required to publish uh, any of their data on the antibody tests uh, to make it available to the public uh, or, or not? Data. FDA, um, and we do not post um, the, the data uh, ourselves either. We do post um, a summary, you know, summary of what we based our decision on. 
uh, within the letter of authorization, which doesn't give you the data that you were probably uh, seeking in that regard. Um, and in, in the past, we've when we have more time, <laughs> we have gone through and done, like with the Zika response, we went through and we did summary data and comparatives of, of the sensitivity and specificity and information like that. We just have, it, 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 there's just way too much out there right now and we can't publish other people's data. Okay, thank you. Uh, and one further question, uh, with the EUA process for all the multiple tests being used, does the normal approval process run concurrently to the clinical use under the EUA? And how long does it take to find out if the test being used by an institution is actually finally approved uh, or not by the FDA? So when you use the word approved, I'm not sure if the questioner is, is asking whether it's, it's uh, when we authorize the emergency use, we are authorizing it based on less data than we would for an actual regulatory uh, pre-clear uh, uh, under our 510k clearance process or under a, a, a marketing application. Um, we do not require that they continue to submit the data to achieve the marketing application once it's been authorized. I'm not sure if that an is answering the question, but we, we look for um, reasonable uh, it really it's a lot of the additional um uh we, we look at valid validation of specificity of uh, uh, uh clinical information that's needed but there's a lot more that would go into getting it to a marketed application okay thank you um and a, a couple questions to dr bala the, the first one is uh for the patients with uh hydroxy um Oroquin prophylaxis, are you following uh, EKGs uh, for QT prolongation? And um, a second question is um, uh, the impact on the lockdown in India and particularly in, in your city, um, is this, um, you know, what sort of, uh, you know, secondary public health uh, problems are uh, resulting uh, from this uh, lockdown? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, the uh, uh, hydroxychloroquine, as I said, uh, uh, we are doing uh, uh, kind of serial ECGs in patients who are admitted with us, and uh, we are following their QT. Uh, we are also, uh, for the healthcare workers, prophylaxis, we are taking an informed consent, and uh, we are telling them about the detail uh, adverse effect profile of hydroxychloroquine, but majority of them are still willing to take it because there's nothing else which is available. We are getting weekly uh, EKGs and uh, of the two EKGs we have uh, done for these patients, uh, for these healthcare workers before giving the weekly dose, we found that there is just a mild uh, QT interval prolongation uh, of few milliseconds, but it is not uh, uh, something which is alarming, which might uh, which might uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, need a stoppage of the drug. Uh, second thing, which the question which you really uh, you know re very very relevant is uh, how has lockdown. Uh, affected or uh, the the current pandemic situation. If you look at the curve uh, of uh, the positive patients which are being reported from India, you'd see that it is not the steep uh, uh, rising curve. We've tried to pull it back. What it has uh, uh, given us is the time to prepare ourselves. So uh, we have had nearly two weeks plus of time uh, with us. And in this time, we've been able to kind of uh, uh, prepare ourselves, prepare our healthcare facilities, uh, organize our uh, workforce, motivate our uh, healthcare workers to come in and help us uh, in managing these cases. Uh, to allay a little bit of anxiety, but at a huge, huge economic uh, cost. Uh, if you if you compare 
the European and U.S. figures with what is happening in India. Uh, we have uh, flattened the curve just a wee bit, not too much, but uh, at a huge economic uh, cost. Uh, but I think uh, uh, the, the administration which has taken such tough decision uh, needs to be complimented because these are difficult decisions and uh, they have uh, give, uh, bought us time to respond. Uh, so that's what, that's what uh, lockdown has done. Okay, th thank you very much. A, a question for Dr. Farsi about the use of uh, anticoagulants uh, uh, routinely uh, on your patients with uh, COVID-19. Is, is this becoming part of the regimen where uh, even in the absence of uh, obvious uh, uh, thromboembolic events that you are putting these patients on an anticoagulant regimen? Uh, yes, um, we're actually um, putting any patient that is discharged is going home on some sort of anticoagulant or an antiplatelet if the platelets are also elevated. But any patient who admitted on more than 50% FIR2 or cannot get out or cannot mobile, uh, move as much, even though we're doing uh, awake pronation, we're thrombolizing, uh, we're, we're, I mean, using anticoagulation on all those patients. And Dr. Farsi, this is Ziad. Can you comment a little bit more on the convalescent plasma use? How are you, uh, what, what consideration uh, to do this practically? You know, how are you getting the plasma and how are you selecting the patients appropriately? So um, the patient selection, this is a, uh, where you have to be one at the trial uh, to be uh, selected as a trial. It's pretty fairly easy to become a trial. You go to one blood and uh, download the IRB and uh, send it. And if you become a trial, uh, there's certain guideline. Most of the guideline, this is a compassionate use, uh, falls under compassionate care. Uh, patient has to be, have to show no improvements and uh, remain hemodynamically unstable and remain uh, hypoxic despite uh, FIO2 of, of 100%. And then you have to check their blood type um, and basically you apply, um, A can receive from AB, B from AB, uh, AB is just from AB and O from everybody. And you're trying to, um, we just had one of our chief from the fire department who was uh, infected, he had an A negative, and luckily we sent some ma major message. We were able to find a, a donor who tested positive and went to one blood and we were able to give uh, plasma and in 36 hours there was some significant hemodynamic changes and the patient uh, the chief was extubated two days later um so i don't want to say it's a miracle so there's mm -hmm. a of donors is there a registry of donors yes it's oneblood.org thank you that's it I have another question for Dr. Bala. Dr. Bala, uh, someone, one of our participants asked, do you have any evidence for the uh, efficacy of hydroxychloroquine as a prophylactic agent? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Okay. Okay. Uh, there is, uh, uh, there are contradictory reports. There is some data which suggests that yes, it is uh, effective. Some uh, uh, reports uh, doubting the efficacy. That's why we are doing it as a part of a multinational, multicentric uh, project. Uh, till the time we have given this drug for a period of four, six to eight weeks and uh, have recorded all kinds of effects, people who, in spite of being on hydroxychloroquine, uh, developing an illness, uh, or becoming uh, positive for uh, COVID, uh, I cannot, I cannot uh, definitely say whether it is really effective or not. Thank you. Uh, this is a question for uh, either Dr. Farsi or Dr. Bala. Uh, can you please comment about the issues of reinfection or redetection uh, in patients that uh, had recovered? Uh, are you uh, aware of any studies uh, at the present time 
investigating this issue and uh, do you have any general uh, comments about uh, this potential problem? This is Dr. Farsi. Uh, we uh, initially um, had an issue with uh, the swab testing where uh, we would have more negative and then turn positive and positive patient turn negative and turn positive. But uh, we had several cases of this and there's been report of a subtype of the COVID-19 um, called the COVID-19C and COVID-19S, but I haven't heard much of the new evidence based on that. Okay, I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Uh, Dr. Kazi, would you like to ask another question or two? Yes, I have two questions for uh, uh, our FDA speaker. Uh, Elizabeth, do you mind talking a little bit about two things? One is, if a drug is already approved, like hydroxychloroquine for malaria prophylaxis and rheumatoid arthritis, uh, why does it need an EUA? And if you have a countermeasure that is uh, uh, being used, how do you decide this one's going to need an expanded IND versus uh, I'm going to go ahead and do an EUA for this drug? Yeah, no, uh, thank you for that. That These are the tough questions that we, we are grappling with. With an unapproved use of an approved product, um, under the Food, Federal Food Drug uh, Cosmetic Act, it's still an unapproved product um, if it's being used off label for a different indication. So it is not approved for use for COVID for, for the, uh, the hydroxychloroquine. Um, and um, typically FDA would say, okay, just use it off label under the practice of medicine. But in a, a response like this, where the CDC is having to make recommendations uh, about it, if the government is making recommendations for use, it's outside, it, 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 you could look at that as being not within an individual patient uh, doctor relationship outside of, of sort of the practice of medicine. That's when we get asked often to issue an EUA for these types of off-label uses so that it is compliant with the Federal Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act. And so that we can also provide the, the dosing and the recommendations, the best practices um, that it, within the labeling. Um, another reason, truthfully, is for the liability protections because it, uh, some would say that would not be a covered countermeasure under the statute that provides the, the protections for those types of products. So that would be for the off-label uses. With regard to expanded access versus EUA, those are the complicated conversations depending on the actual um, uh, how much information do we have on the, the data that you guys are discussing in the literature, how much clinical trials out there, is it feasible to get these networks in place to do the clinical trials? And and with hydroxychloroquine, truthfully, it was really the, the off-label use driving shortages for the approved populations that that we were we were having to import and to address supply chain shortages through a mechanism like EUA. Um, Expanded access, we prefer to do if we if we can, if we can get expanded access in place, if we can get the protocols in place, um, if the networks are there, those are the mechanisms we do. So it really comes down to the operational and practical elements as to which mechanisms become uh, more more appropriate. Thank you so much. Uh, Paul, would you like to uh, uh, conclude or add some? Yeah, I'd like just some final uh, comments. Uh, it's uh, coming up to 4.15. Uh, again, thanks to the uh, faculty uh, for outstanding presentations and, and for a very robust uh, Q&A session. I realize uh, we did not get to all the uh, Q&A uh, responses, but uh, we are uh, tailing these uh, Q&As and uh, trying to put up responses uh, to some of these questions, at least uh, up on our website. And you see the website address, so please visit the website and we'll try to get uh, responses up as quickly as we can. As it uh, turns out, uh, we do have a, a couple of very pertinent uh, webinars uh, coming up just within, a, within the next week. So uh, on this Friday, uh, we're gonna have a, uh, um, a town hall, uh, which is gonna be uh, all Q&A uh, about PPE. I know some of you had uh, comments uh, today about PPE. 
And uh, you know, please attend uh, the town hall. It's uh, 12 p.m. Eastern on uh, Friday, and uh, we'll have uh, three experts on PPE uh, handle uh, the questions. So that's this Friday at 12 noon. And then next Wednesday uh, at uh, 3 p.m., uh, we're going to have an entire webinar on testing. Uh, Dr. Pora, uh, who developed uh, the assay for the University of, of Rochester, uh, will be uh, discussing uh, uh, her work and, and also discussing uh, antibodies. So uh, please attend uh, that if, if, you, if you have a, uh, the opportunity. And in upcoming webinars, uh, certainly uh, we'll, we'd like to address uh, many of the pulmonary issues uh, that have come up. Uh, several of them were discussed today. Very important. It's a new new disease, and uh, we want to bring to you the, the best uh, information we can. Uh, and so, look forward to a, a, a webinar on the pulmonary complications of COVID-19 uh, upcoming in in uh, early May. Again, I'd like to thank my co-host, uh, Dr. Uh, Ziad Kazi. I'd like to thank the uh, uh, the uh, partner societies uh, and and CDC for pushing out uh, information about uh, this webinar, and also to our uh, FDA colleagues as well. Uh, have a good day.